Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. When you first look at pictures of mixing boards, they can be very intimidating. Just, wow, look at all of those knobs and adjustments and stuff. It just makes the eyes glaze over. It might not seem like it, but it isn't nearly as complicated as you might think at first glance. I thought that I would provide a basic introduction to mixing boards for you in this video so as to dispel some of that fog. By the end of this video, you will at least know what to look for and have an idea how to use a mixing board in the most basic ways. I have been involved with mixing boards and sound systems since the early 1970s. Every mixing board is unique to itself and its siblings and close cousins. But there are some things that all mixing boards have in common. They may not all be located in the same place on the board or maybe use exactly the same terminology, but they are there somewhere. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So let's begin with a bit of mixing board terminology. The first term is gain. This talks about how much amplification we have. The more amplification, the louder the signal gets. The less the amplification we have, the quieter the signal gets. Next, we have to address frequency. The higher the pitch of the tone, the higher the frequency. Frequency is reported in hertz. Normal audio ranges run from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Now, as a person running a mixing board, the next term is very important to understand, not just the term itself, but how it plays out from the person listening to what you're doing. This term is dB, which is short for decibels. Everything that we see in the mixing board is reported in dB or decibels. It's not a linear thing, so a 3 dB change doubles the power. If we add another 3 dB, the power is now four times the original. The average person only notices 3 dB changes in power level. If we have a person sitting in a particular location with a particular sound system, then this average person will only notice a change in volume when we either double or have the amount of power being delivered to the speakers. This represents a 3 dB change on our mixing board and a 3 dB change in sound pressure level to the listener. The average non-professional singer's volume when they go from their compatible pitch range to one outside of their best pitch range can vary up to 20 dB. This is a change of 100 times in power level. Yes, 100 times. The person singing can go from easily heard to totally not heard or easily heard to blasting the listener's ears out of their head. The point here is that we cannot just set and forget the levels when we're doing a live performance, especially if we're talking about the average untrained non-professional singer. We have to be ready to increase or decrease the levels for a singer depending on the song that they are singing and where they are in their pitch range. Next, we have the fader which is the sliding control that we generally use to control the loudness of the signal going out to the speakers or the recording device. Now, there are two terms related to this. There are the pre-fader and the post-fader. Pre-fader means that the output that we're talking about is not affected by the fader associated with the channel in question. Post-fader means that the output that we're talking about is affected by the fader associated with the channel in question. Then there are the auxiliary sends. This refers to the outputs from the mixing board that are not the main outputs. These may be used to drive an amplifier for monitor speakers or maybe recording or streaming devices. Now that you have a bit of a handle on the basic terminology, let's take a look at all these knobs and buttons. Like I said, every mixing board is different, and yet there are a lot of similarities, too. I will emphasize 
that the operator's manual for your mixing board is your friend. I encourage you to spend some quality time with it. For the sake of this video, I'm going to be using the Allen and Heath Mix Wizard 16-2 as our example as I work through the controls. Now, let's take a look at our mixing board. It is just covered with controls. It just makes the eyes water to look at it. But don't let this intimidate you because what we are seeing are 16 identical channels. Each channel has its own column of controls. If we just look down one channel and know how the one channel works, then we end up knowing the whole board because the other 15 channels are exact duplicates. So let's start at the top of the channel and work our way down. The first thing that we come to is a gain control. The gain control sets the overall maximum gain for the entire channel. We use this when we're setting up a channel for use. So how do we adjust this? Well, to tell you this, I have to jump down the channel to a little indicator next to the fader at the bottom. This little red indicator is labeled peak exclamation point. On some mixing boards, this is labeled level set and operates the same way as what I'm going to be describing here. When this peak or level set indicator illuminates, it means that the tops and or bottoms of the audio going through the channel are being chopped off, which will produce distortion in the audio. You will be able to hear it in the headphones or through the speakers. So to set this gain control, we have the person who's going to use the channel do whatever it is that they're going to be doing for the set, and then adjust the gain control at the top of the channel so that this peak indicator only momentarily and rarely illuminates. This is an example of setting the gain control. You can see that uh, it's, uh, it's blinking all the time. So now I'm going to turn down the gain and I'm going to turn it down. Now see it's just every once in a while I'm going to turn it down some more. So even at the peaks, it only very, very, very on the very peaks might blink just a little bit. And then we back it off just a little bit more. If during the set you notice the peak indicator illuminating, you may have to turn the gain down just a little bit more. Right next door to the gain control is a button which is labeled pad minus 30 dB. This is used if the gain control is turned way, way down to get the right level for the channel. We press this button to decrease the input level to the mixing board by 30 dB, which will allow us to increase the level as set on the gain control, bringing it up and into a more moderate setting. This essentially takes a line level signal and turns it into a microphone level signal for the mixer. If a channel seems way too quiet, even with the gain turned all the way up, check to see if this button is pressed. If it is, then don't forget, turn the gain down first, then press the button again to remove the 30 dB pad, then readjust the gain to get the level right. The next big section of the mixing board is the equalizer section. This is used to adjust the frequency response of the particular channel. Now these are set up as part of the overall system setup and probably should not be touched except by folks who understand their operation. And their operation is out of the scope of this video, so I'm not going to explain it here. In our case, we have a cover that goes over them to prevent accidental changes from being made. The next big section we come to is the aux sends section. Aux is short for auxiliary, which means it is not the main output. And a send refers to an output. We are sending a signal out of the mixing board to some other system or device. So this section is the one that we use to control the signals that go to the various auxiliary outputs of the mixing board. The signal for each channel can be individually adjusted for the respective auxiliary sends using these controls. This particular mixing board has a total of six auxiliary sends. The first two are 
pre-fader only. Now this means that the fader control that's below, we'll talk about that in a little while, has no control over the loudness of the signal going out these first two sends. This is controlled by the overall gain control up at the very top and the controls in this section, and that's it. In the case of this system, these go out to an amplifier which drive the monitor speakers for the people doing the music. There are two of these, one for the left monitor speaker and one for the right monitor speaker. The next two are switchable between pre-fader and post-fader. A single switch controls both of these outputs for the, each channel. Post-fader means that the fader control, which we're going to talk about in a little while, does affect the output volume of these auxiliary sends as well as these two knobs. When the post pre button is pressed, they are configured as pre fader outputs. If the button is not depressed, then they are configured as post fader outputs. At one point in time, we had monitor speakers on the piano and the organ so that the organ player could hear the piano player better and vice versa. And these outputs fed these two monitor speakers. The last two are post fader outputs only. In our case, these feed the computer audio input for recording and the hearing assistance transmitter. The next control we come to is the pan control. The main output of the mixing board has both left and right channels. And this pan control allows us to choose how much of the particular channel signal goes to the left output and how much of it goes to the right output. Turning this control fully counterclockwise sends all of the signal to the left main channel and none of it to the right main channel. Turning this control fully clockwise sends all of the signal to the right main channel and none of it to the left main channel. Setting this in the middle sends an equal amount to both the left and right main channels. So if you're looking to record in stereo, then your left mic should have this fully counterclockwise and the right mic should have this control fully clockwise. Generally, for most situations like what we are doing here, this control sits right in the middle. Now we come to the white on button. This button connects the signal from the channel to the various outputs. It is the one that you use to turn on and off the signal from this channel. It is a push on, push off type button just like the rest. When this button is depressed, then the green indicator next to it lights up to show you that this channel is selected. Anything that is configured to get this channel signal will now begin receiving this channel signal. When this button is out, then the green indicator is extinguished indicating that the channel is now inactive. The next control in the column is the PFL button. PFL stands for Pre-Fader Listen. What this allows you to do is to hear what is going on with a particular channel or channels, because you can have more than one of these selected at a time, without activating the channel with the on button or going live. You will hear the signal in the headphones. In some circles, this is called PFL Solo or Rude Solo. If this button is depressed, then the peak indicator will illuminate continuously. There will also be another red indicator illuminated up near the headphone volume adjustment knob. This other indicator is labeled PFL in our case and Rude Solo elsewhere. When any PFL buttons are depressed, the only thing you will hear in the headphones and the only thing that will be indicated on the level meter in the upper right hand corner of the mixing board is the audio associated with whatever PFL buttons are pressed. Normally these are all shut off, the buttons are up. Now the very last control in our channels column is the oft mentioned fader. It is a sliding volume control for the channel's audio. This is the one that we will be touching the most. Sliding the slider up makes things louder. Sliding the fader down makes things quieter. If this fader is all the way down, then all of the post-fader outputs will be essentially shut off. 
the pre-fader outputs will be as active as always as they do not depend on the fader. The only way to disconnect a channel's audio from pre-fader outputs is to deactivate the white on button for the channel. Now that we've covered all of the individual controls for the channel, I will need to turn my attention to the master faders and monitor controls. So we have a fader associated with each of the channels. Adjusting these individual faders properly sets the mix of signals that can reach the outputs. This big mix hits the master faders at the right of the mixing console. Now the main output is organized in left and right channels. They operate exactly like the faders for the individual channels. The difference here is that we set up the system so that these pretty much should live set at 0 dB all of the time. Sometimes we can accidentally move them, and so checking them periodically during a set to be sure that this is not the case is a good practice. Then there are the aux send master faders. Now each of the aux sends has its own master fader. Instead of sl sliding adjustment like the main has, these are just little knobs. You can listen individually to the aux send outputs by selecting them with the console monitor push buttons and listening in the headphones. If any of these are selected, then the only thing you will hear in the headphones and the only indication you'll get on the level meter will be what is selected. Normally, these should all be up and not selected. The headphone volume is adjusted by the last control that I'm going to cover. This exists just above the console monitor push buttons, but I'm not done yet. We still have the level meter. The very, very last thing that I'm going to cover is the mixing console's level meter. It is color-coded with left and right displays indicating the level on the left and the right channels respectively. Green is good, yellow is caution, red is clipping or close to it, not good. Like everything else in the console, the scale is in dB. When the system is set up, the various system components are configured so that everything is 0 dB together and the listening level in the auditorium is at the right level when we have 0 dB. So our goal is to adjust our levels so that the level stays right around the 0 dB mark and sometimes above this a little. We listen to the mix in the headphones adjust the individual levels to maintain the right mix, and then also to maintain the master level right. The musical instrument levels generally don't change very much, so most of our focus is on the vocal mics. We watch the level meter, we listen to the mix, and we dynamically adjust the levels of the vocal mics to maintain proper levels for our listeners. So there you go a quick tour of an audio mixing board. Again, while every mixing board is going to be different from every other mixing board in the specifics, every mixing board has certain capabilities. They might be found in different places, they might be called different things, they might be, have different labels, but the capabilities are still there. I hope that this gets you a leg up that you needed to get going with your particular mixing board. Remember, your manual is a great resource. Read it. Now, if you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Toodaloots.